My Jesus knows when I am lonely. He knows each pain. He sees each tear. He understands each lonely heartache. He understands because he cares. His life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Welcome back. Hope you enjoyed those Take a Moment segments. That's some of Tate's very first work. And you can see that this is a young man that from the very beginning, uh, he, he, was just, he was just a natural. Uh, Scott was, was with me just a moment ago. Scott Lloyd, one of Tate's very best friends and also a member of the church where I preach there in Bremen, Georgia. We, we have Brother Jeff back with us now. But, uh, you know, we, Scott and I were talking about Tate winning the Home Run Sermon Award at the Middle Tennessee Future Ministers Training Camp. Uh, there in Columbia, Tennessee, and, and something that I forgot to mention there that I wanted to share with our viewers, and, and again, to show the influence of this young man uh, for good and how, how, what he meant to some of these preacher training camps and things of that nature. But now the Middle Tennessee Future Ministers Training Camp has changed that award, and from now on it's going to be known as the Tate Williams Home Run Sermon Award. Uh, we mentioned foundations at the Memphis School of Preaching, which is also a future preacher training camp. They now are going to have uh, each year an award. They, they've, they've done this where they have an award for, sort of for the top sermon that those young men do. And now it, it, from, from this point forward will be known as the Tate Williams Top Sermon Award. Uh, this young man loved to preach the gospel. Mm -hmm. He loved going to these future preacher training camps. And uh, Jeff's going to tell us in just a moment about BJ's boys. We laughed about this at the memorial. And, you know, BJ understands and we all understood that these... These boys, they belong to Christ. They are right. Christians and they are, they are bond servants, as the New Testament teaches us of Jesus Christ. But we kind of affectionately referred to some of them as BJ's boys. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand it off to you, Jeff, and let you tell our viewers about that a little bit more well, about it. Well, I tell you, I like BJ's boys a little better than the <laughs> Memphis Mafia, which was mentioned. And that's all in jest, of course. But, you know, uh, some very special young men part of BJ's boys. Matter of fact, I want to make sure that I get them all, but you know, Brandon Notgrass, Brandon's dad is a friend of mine, faithful gospel preacher in Middle Tennessee. Uh, Stephen Aiken, a young man that I've watched grow up where I preach in the Cleveland area. Ryan Painter, and of course, Scott Lloyd, who was just with us that did a great job. Harley Halliburton, love Harley, and Sam Pace. I went to preaching school with Harley's dad. Oh, he and is I that were right? in the same uh -huh. class at Memphis School of Preaching. Yeah. Well, you know, Sam was with Tate in the accident. They were going yes. to rotate in this gospel meeting right. out at Avenger, Texas. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Sam was going to preach that morning and Tate that night. They had it laid out exactly, and they were sharing it with me at the McCroy Bible Camp earlier this year of what they were going yes. to do. But I mentioned all these guys, and, and they're part of the foundation's Future Preachers Training Camp. Now, B.J. Clark directs that camp, does a great job. And the Middle Tennessee Camp in Columbia, Tennessee, under the oversight of the Gray Mirror Church of Christ Elders, that is directed by Kirk Brothers. Now, we mention that because Tate would want us to let everyone know, uh, you know, someone may be watching this that has a grandson sure. uh, or a son that, you know, I'd like for them to know more of that. Well, if they would contact us here at GBN, we will gladly get them in touch with either or both of these camps and let them know and of the their one interest. In, uh, Pensacola as well. Yeah, Pensacola, Florida, at the Northwest Florida School of Biblical Studies, where Sydney um, White. Whoa, thank you, Sydney White. <laughs> if I was going to say wrong name, but where Sydney White is the director, sure. and Sydney, when he views this, will get me for that because I should remember. <laughs> but you know, these are some great camps that allow young men to develop their talent and their ability Absolutely. that we can use today in the Lord's kingdom. Uh, not that we've made this a GBN policy, but I think it's safe to say we don't consider Tate as a, uh, we did not consider Tate as a preacher of tomorrow. No. He was a preacher of today, just like all of our guys we've just mentioned here. And, uh, and you know, what I love about Tate 
being the just one man, Chad, is I was able to meet a lot of great young people through Tate, right. which just encouraged me. You were talking about the memorial service. Uh, before we began, I stood over in the hallway where several of the guys were and young ladies that were close to Tate. And, and I just stood over there just to listen to them because, you know, I had just turned 50. I wanted a little bit of youth to come <laughs> on my side. And, and like I said, I want to stay in good with these guys because when you and I are gumming down chicken in a rest home, I want these guys to come see us. <laughs> right. And so, you know, very special young men and, and, and the great work that they're doing. And with Tate, you know, we were um, uh, talking about some things. Uh, very special young lady in Tate's life, Kaylee Dunn. Thanks. And I want to talk a little bit more about Kaylee uh, here in just, just a little bit. Uh, because uh, we talk about teenagers and all and something special that we're doing here at GBN. But before we do that, we have another Focus on Faith with Tate Williams. So ladies and gentlemen, if you'll join us, and in this special Focus on Faith, it's a unique Focus on Faith, you get to hear two of Tate's lessons in one broadcast. Let's join that right now. God loves us. And this is something that we as Christians are completely certain of. Yeah, we know that God loves us. We know that God loves us because He created this beautiful world for us to live in. As we see in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, all the beautiful things that have been made in this world, this world itself and everything that's in creation was made for us because God loves us. We know that God loves us because he, because he sent His only Son to die on the cross for our sins. As it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He sent His one and only Son to this earth to be mocked and ridiculed, beaten, and to die for us because He loves us. We know that God loves us because He offers to us eternal life, as it says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are hopelessly lost in sin. Each and every one of us are dead in sin, and God knew this. And so He sent His Son to offer us eternal life out of love for us. Brethren, the love of God is astounding. The love of God is unprecedented. The love of God is matchless. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we'll look at verses 28 through 39. Beginning in verse 28, it reads, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ Jesus that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For a few minutes today, brethren, let us consider together the matchless love of God. The first thing that I want us to consider today, we can see in verses 28 through 30, that all things work together for good. You know, life is hard. 
Sometimes we're going to have a lot of down times. We're going to face a lot of difficult things in this life, especially in the Christian life. We're going to suffer in the Christian life. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Look at how Christ chooses to refer to the Christian life. He calls it as being a sheep in the midst of wolves. Can you imagine being that sheep and realizing that you're surrounded by vicious wolves? You know, if you're that sheep, you're going to quickly realize that you're not about to have a very good day. And yet that's how Christ chooses to describe the Christian life. Further in the scripture it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all who that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. We as Christians are going to face some tough times. You know, as you go through the scripture, not once will you find anywhere where it says that the Christian life is a walk in the park. Nowhere does it say that the Christian life is easy. But we do read in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, the Christian life described in this way. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The Christian life is described as a race. And it's not just a simple little sprint that starts and it's over. But brethren, what's being described to us here is that of a marathon. A race that requires strength and endurance and patience. Something that's going to test us. And what's more, this race that we're running isn't even a race that's run on a smooth and easy path. Rather, it's described in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14 in this way. For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be who find it. The race that we run in, as Christians is a difficult race. It's a difficult race in and of itself, and it's also being run on a difficult path. And as we run this race as Christians, bad things are going to happen. But bear in mind the matchless love of God, all things work together for good. Now, that doesn't mean that, let's say, uh, we break our arm, we fail a test, or we lose our job, or we lose our house, or if we get in a car wreck, or if we lose a loved one. That doesn't mean that good things are going to come from that. I mean, look at who this promise is made to. In verse 29 of Romans chapter 8, this promise is being made to those who are conformed to the image of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul says, Be ye therefore imitators of me, even as I am of Christ Jesus. As Christians, we are to mold our lives after Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are not to model our lives after anyone or anything but that of Christ. And if we do, all things will work together for good. But not once in this passage do we read that all things will work together for good now. You see, that promise is never made. However, it was intended for this promise to be kept in heaven one day. So if we conform ourselves to the image of Christ, all things will work together for good in heaven. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Christ said, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Brethren, let not your heart be troubled. Christ is in heaven right now, preparing for us a home in heaven. And look at what's said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. It reads, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Brethren, no matter what happens to us in this world, no matter how bad things get, those things simply cannot compare 
to the glory and wonder compared to the joy that we will experience in heaven one day. Oh, the matchless love of God, all things work together for good. Now, the second thing that I want us to consider today is that if God is for us, who is against us? As I mentioned earlier, we are a sheep in the midst of wolves. Living in this world day by day, we are going to find ourselves surrounded by those who simply want nothing more than to watch us fall. People who want to watch us fail. People who want simply nothing more than to crush our faith and to crush our hopes. Things are going to be tough. You know, we're in a spiritual war, and there could be times where we can doubt whether or not the result of this war is truly going to be in our favor. You know, there could be times living in this world where we just can't think that things could possibly get any worse, and they do. There could be times where we can begin to feel as if we just can't feel any lower than we do, and we do. There are going to be times where we can feel as if the government in this nation couldn't possibly do anything more against the Word of God, and they do. But bear in mind the matchless love of God. Let's consider a few verses in this regard. Look at Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verses 6 through 10. It reads, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. Brethren, everything is going to be okay because God is our helper. The text says it's better to put our confidence in Him than any man. Now, why would the text tell us that it's better to put our confidence in Him than any man? Brethren, because God is not a man. He is the almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful master and creator of all that there is. And He is on our side. Also consider Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6. Hebrews 13 and verse 6 tells us, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what shall man do to me. The Lord is our helper. And no matter who or how many of people try to stand in our way and try to stand themselves against us with God as our helper, with God on our side, no man can stand against us. Also, let's consider Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It reads, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thereon day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not affrighted, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Brethren, if we meditate on the word of God day and night, if we take the word of God with us wherever we go, God is with us wherever we go. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. The Lord your God is with you each and every day. Also, consider Psalm 3 and verse 6. It reads, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. When the people of this dark and sinful world set themselves against us, when they surround us and seek to destroy us, we can be confident because God is on our side. Now, as we continue to consider this thought that God is for us, let us consider a thought from Romans 8 and verse 32. It says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. God delivered up His Son for us. 
He sent His Son to this earth to be mocked and ridiculed for us. And look at what Jesus had to say about this in John chapter 15 and verse 18. In John 15, 18, Christ said, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Brethren, the world is going to hate us for who we are and for whom and for what we stand for. But bear in mind the matchless love of God. He sent His Son to this world to be hated first. Christ died, but He now stands on our side. And with Him on our side, we can overcome anything. And as we notice in verses 35 and 36 of Romans chapter 8, that we are clearly going to have to face things in our life. In verse 36, Paul says it will be as if we are sheep going before the slaughter, as if we are being killed all the day long. But brethren, God is for us. God is on our side. Let's consider one more verse in this regard. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Matthew 5, 10 through 12 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all men are evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, it may seem a little childish, but as I think about this, as I think about the fact that God is for us, I can't help but think of a song that I heard when I was younger uh, with, with these lyrics. It said, God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Godzilla, the monsters on TV. God is bigger than the boogeyman, and he's watching out for you and for me. Like I said, it's a little childish, but you think about what that song is saying. You think about actually how true that that is. You know, if that song, if that fact, you know, that God is bigger, if God is there, if that can bring comfort to a small child who's simply afraid of the monster under the bed or the monster in their closet, how much more so can that same thought not bring those of us who are older comfort as well? Think about it. God is bigger. You know, God is bigger than anything that we may face in our lives. No matter what it is, God is for us and God is with us. Oh, the matchless love of God. He is on our side. The third and final thing that I want us to consider today, we see in verses 37 through 39. And the text says, we are more than conquerors. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19. John 19, we'll look at verses 28 through 30. It reads, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon a hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. Rather than think about these words. It is finished. These are not words of defeat. Rather than these are words of of victory. It is finished. Because Jesus uttered these words, we are more than conquerors. Because Jesus said the words, it is finished, we have victory through Christ Jesus our Lord, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of these words that Christ uttered, because He said, it is finished, we can have peace amidst tribulation, as we see in John 16 and verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye may have peace. In the world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. 
Because Jesus uttered the words, it is finished. Because he overcame, brethren, we can overcome. As we see in Revelation 12, verses 10 through 11. And I heard a great voice in heaven saying, Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the words of their testimony, and they loved not their life even unto death. Brethren, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 1, in verse 18, we are waged in a spiritual warfare. But through Jesus Christ our Lord, because He uttered those words, it is finished. We have victory. It was God's plan from all eternity to send His Son to this earth to die on the cross for our sins so that we could have eternal life. We have a mighty God on our side and He has had a perfect plan for all eternity. With God and His Son on our side, we can have victory. We can conquer anything that we face. Let's consider one final verse from Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 31. It reads, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from Jehovah, and the justice due to me is passed away from my God? Hast thou not known Hast thou not heard the everlasting God, Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to him that hath no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait for Jehovah shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles, they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and faint not. Our God is all-knowing. Our God is all-powerful. Our God is everlasting. And with Him on our side, we will have victory. Oh, the matchless love of God, we are more than conquerors. Now as we conclude our lesson today, let us consider verses 38 and 39 of Romans chapter 8. In Romans 8, verses 38 through 39, the text reads, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves us. And He will not allow anything or anyone to cause this love for us to stop. He won't allow anything to separate us from Him. Yes, you know, we just read this list of things that God has said he will not allow to separate us from Him. You know, as we read this list, though, we find one thing that's missing. One thing that's not mentioned in this list. One thing that can separate us from God. The one thing that can separate us from God, the one thing that can separate you from your God, is you. Brethren, God's not going to go anywhere. God's not going to move. If we happen to find ourselves in a separated state from God, if we find ourselves away from God, it's not His fault. It's through our disobedience to His will. It's through our turning our back on Him that we will be separated from our God. So what's the message? God loves you. But it's our job to love Him back. And if we love Him back, we will keep His commandments. We will do the things that He's commanded us to do, and we must hold to Him. And if we do, all things will work together for good. God will be for us, and we will be more than conquerors. Oh, the matchless love of God. 
Welcome back once again. We are paying tribute. As the Bible says, render honor to whom honor. And we're paying tribute tonight to a young man who certainly is worthy of honor, worthy of imitation because he imitated Christ Jesus. Paul said, be imitators of me even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1. <clears throat> we're going to shift gears in just a moment, but uh, we were talking a little bit earlier before we went into uh, that last focus on faith, actually two lessons in one broadcast, but uh, we were talking about the Memphis Mafia, and, and Tate loved going to Foundation's Future Preacher Training Camp in Memphis, Tennessee at the Memphis School of Preaching, and Scott Lloyd was with us just a few moments ago, and uh, we were talking with Scott about several things, one of Tate's very best friends in the world, and uh, Scott's family are all members of the Bremen Church of Christ where I preach. Uh, Brother Allen is his father and Lauren is his sister, but it was Miss Karen who actually looked at a picture of these young men. They're standing there with BJ at Foundations mm -hmm. and had their picture taken with him. And uh, there are all these young men standing around and, and there's Brother BJ. And Miss Karen made the statement. She said, BJ looks like he's some sort of godfather there. And these, these are his <laughs> henchmen or something. And so... She coined the term Memphis Mafia, so I thought it'd be nice to share that with our viewers, how that term came to be. And as Jeff said, that's all in jest, but it, it, th these young men had a lot of fun, but what was great was they always had clean fun. They, they served the Lord. They loved the Lord, and Tate was a ringleader leading these young men in service to God. You know, Jeff had mentioned, we, we talked a lot about Tate's first sermon here at GBN, the Just One Man sermon, and uh, when Tate had the accident, Jeff had posted on his Facebook. I remember seeing you had mm -hmm. posted a link to that sermon uh, as it was hosted on the GBN YouTube channel on the Internet. And I clicked on it that morning and began listening to Tate. And it, It's ironic because when Tate would preach at the Bremen congregation where I preach, a lot of times he and other young men were speaking when I was gone or else he was preaching at a future preacher training camp or, or maybe a small congregation in our area. And so I had not actually heard Tate preach a full sermon. I'd heard him do a Wednesday night invitation. And so I, I clicked on that and began watching this young man preach. And I remember Brother Jeff just mm -hmm. thinking, wow, mm -hmm. uh, the passion, the zeal, and our viewers, if, you, if you've been with us for this entire tribute broadcast, you, you, you know what I'm talking about. The zeal, his love for the Lord, and his sense of urgency for the souls of men is, is so evident as he preaches that message from the Word of God. And I remember that so well. And, and Jeff also mentioned the meeting that Tate was going to preach when he and Sam uh, had this auto accident through no fault of their own, kind of being in the wrong place at the wrong mm -hmm. time. But these young men were going to kind of tag team preach a gospel meeting. I joked with Tate that they were going to do tag team preaching. But the last time I was here at GBN with mm -hmm. Tate, um, he, was, he was sitting just beyond the cameras in front of me. And uh, I told him that, time, that Sunday night when I asked him about coming, I said, well, you may be bored just sitting there. And he said, no, I can work on my sermons. And on the way home, I, we, we took a little longer to tape than we thought we would that day. And I apologized to him. And he said, no, it's okay because he said, I'm excited. I finally got these sermons done. I got mm -hmm. them ready. And so that's one of the things that I remember about the last time I was here, mm -hmm. and, and especially particularly the last time I was here with, uh, with Tate. But uh, we're going to we're gonna shift gears a little bit here, and I'm going to, I'm going to give this over to Brother Jeff and let him talk about where we're going from, from here with our tribute to Tate Williams. Well, what's special the rest of the way is that we are going to show footage that has never been seen before here on GBN. And what we're going to be doing is, you know, just a little bit first of background. Uh, for the past two to three years, and we've had to work with it carefully due to other matters here at the network, Chad, we have longed to develop a program for teenagers. And we've had it, as we would say, simmering on the back burner for a while. But the program is simply going to be titled Text Message. And someone said, you know, that's a very unique name for a program. Well, what do teenagers do today more than anything in the world? Text they message. text one another. They text message. And so... Uh, what greater thing than for our teens to learn of the text, God's Word, right. and to have a message brought forth. Well, when the idea was brought up, uh, I wanted Tate to be a part of the program in the, um, in the part of what he calls what it means to the teen. It was just a brief commentary on certain verses of the Bible and then just a brief commentary anywhere from three to six minutes. 
And so Tate had arrived from one of his mission trips and he was still battling jet lag at the moment. And when he arrived back for uh, from one of his mission trips, he came to the studio. And it's ironic as we sit here, I can picture where he was in here and, and, and I was with him watching the takes and all, and I was trying to be so careful because I didn't want to make him nervous that I was sitting there watching him, but he, he handled it very well. Well, we've never shown those because we're still developing the program. Now, as the program will come up with a, another host, because there's more to this. When we wanted Tate to do what it means to the team, the host that we had in mind due to workload, it wasn't happening. So it was in the summer of 2012, I spoke with Mark Teske and I said, I believe I have a host for text message. I said, what about Tate Williams? Well, Mark was familiar with Tate due to his focus on faith work and all. And so it was well approved. And Tate was in the process of developing the program and, and, and you know, taking it and going with it. Now, I have a little bit of fun with this because there's reasons why I wanted Tate to host the program. And I remember speaking to his girlfriend, Kaylee Dunn, and, uh, and asking Kaylee, I need permission to tell this at the memorial. And Kaylee is a wonderful young lady. Uh, her parents, Brad and Angela Dunn, are just very special people. And, uh, and just think a lot of them. And Kaylee is a very precious young lady. And so I asked for her permission to say the following because I wanted Tate to host the program for three reasons. Number one, he was a sound young man in the faith. That first and foremost. Number two, he was comfortable with the camera. Not everybody is comfortable on this side of the camera. It's a challenge. But the third reason, he looked good. <laughs> I mean, he was a very nice looking young man that if a young lady turned to GBN for text message, I wanted her to look and say, I would like to go out with that guy. <laughs> Or a young man would turn over and say, you know, he would be a great guy to run around with. And that would fit in both places because BJ's boys, they were all close, good friends. And, and something else too, these guys would travel miles and hours just to spend time with each other. Mm -hmm. And then of course, the same with Kay Lee, who lived about two to three hours from Tate. But Brad and Angela didn't mind bringing her down to visit or meeting halfway Another example of godly parents that go the extra mile. And all these folks we've been mentioning, Scott's parents, Tate's parents, Kaylee's parents, uh, Sam Pace's parents, uh, Marvin and Elizabeth Pace. We're talking about people that go the extra mile to make certain that their boys and girls have the very best in faith, and, and, and to get them with those of a like precious faith that Peter talked about. You know, it's interesting, Jeff, you mentioned that. And if you ever watch athletes, um, especially I, I'm a, most people that know me know I'm a big hockey fan. Mm -hmm. uh, Tate and I joked that he was going to be my hockey watching buddy because everywhere I preach in the South, people don't know anything about hockey and mm -hmm. <laughs> very few people watch it. But, uh, you know, I, I remember a lot of interviews that I watch of hockey players. They always talk about their moms and their dads. And, mm -hmm. you know, mom got up so early in the morning to drive me to the rink. And sometimes I played on a travel team and she'd That's take right. me all over the country. Mm -hmm. These young men and Kaylee and others, they have parents mm -hmm. that make those same sacrifices, if not more, mm -hmm. but for a much higher cause than some sport. Mm -hmm. It's for things that are of eternal importance mm -hmm. and things that are not just going to benefit the world by giving some sort of sports entertainment. They right. benefit the world for eternity. Oh, and, so and they, true. You know, you mentioned it. You just can't say enough about these parents, what they do, the links to which Kaylee was often at Bremen. Mm -hmm. um, Scott, Tate, Thad, some of these other boys, they're all over the country mm -hmm. doing, uh, it may be a homeschool trip to learn more about spiritual matters. It may be a future preacher training camp. It may be Bible mm -hmm. camp. It may be going on a mission trip. Tate was all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you mentioned him coming back from a mission trip when he had him here and he's got jet lag, but he's, he's still here doing stuff, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, their, their parents went to great lengths and go to great lengths to make sure those young men are involved in the greatest work in the world. And, you know, I don't know if I ever even had the chance to tell you what it, what it meant to Tate that, that GBN had asked him to host that program. That was a very, mm -hmm. uh, you know, some young men might get kind of cocky about that or think, you know, well, I must be something. I'm hosting this show. Mm -hmm. It was a very sobering thing to Tate. And mm -hmm. he took that so seriously. And he, he 
he put a lot of pressure on himself, not to an unhealthy extent, but he wanted to make sure he did the very best he could do. And he and I talked about that a lot. He was mm -hmm. very, very appreciative uh, of, of the, the trust that was placed in him and asking mm -hmm. him to host that program. Yeah, and, and that trust he had earned. Absolutely. When we first looked at the program, I wanted Tate to have a part in it. But as it went on another year or so, and you could see how Tate had grown, I, I looked at Mark one day, I said, this is our host. And, and, you know, and also we talk about the, the blessing to parents. I think about two of, of godly elderships that support GBN in so many ways, of course, financially, sure. uh, of congregations of Churches of Christ. And, and that brings to mind Chris Stevenson and, and the fine elders there at Bremen, Georgia, and, uh, you know, Jimmy and uh, Martin. I just, great men who had the vision to say, we can make a studio happen here in West Georgia where text message would have been recorded and taped. And, and the joy of Tate working with you and your background of GBN. And as I've told so many people, I would not be here had it not been for you. And so we have that opportunity. Well, what we want to show everyone tonight, Chad, is what's never been seen before. These are the segments for text message simply titled, What It Means to the Team. And we're going to run these all together and you will enjoy as we continue our evening with Tate Williams. I'm looking at 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. You know, I want to talk about the first part of this verse. It says, Let no man despise thy youth. Before I get into that, I want to make four quick points. One, Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 through 23 and it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, and the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Two, all who are in Christ, those that are those who have been baptized, are in his body. Galatians chapter 3 verses 27 through 28. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither bond nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. 3. All Christians are in Christ. Romans 6 and verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Four, therefore all Christians are in Christ's church. Ephesians chapter 10, Ephesians 3, verses 10 through 11. To the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Having said this, if Christ is the head of the church, and if all who are in Christ are in his body, and if all Christians are in Christ, and if Christ is the head of the church, his body, then all Christians, young and old, are subject to his authority and authorized to do those things that he has commanded us to do. Sadly, the world has gotten to where it expects next to nothing from its young people. Society believes that young people aren't meant to understand. And even if they understand, they don't expect them to care. And even if they care, society doesn't really expect them to do anything about it. However, a higher authority than that of this world is there and expects great things from us, including the young people. Allow me to prove this. Turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 16 and verse 15. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every, every creature. And Matthew 5, 13 through 17 says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt shall lose its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and trodden underfoot by men. Ye are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and hide it under a bushel. Rather, they put on a candlestick, and it gives light to all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that you may glorify your, they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Also look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 
in verses 16 and 17. It says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. If you'll notice that in none of these verses do we see any exceptions. All Christians have been given the same commands. That's all of us, young and old. One last thing I want to mention, go back to 1 Timothy 4.12, and it says, Let no man despise thy youth. Paul says no man. That would include men in this world, men in the church, and Christians, that would mean yourself. Christian teenagers, we fall under that no man category. So young Christians, as we strive to do the will of God and do the things that we have been commanded to do, we mustn't let anyone, including ourselves, tell us that we can't do great things. I'm Tate Williams, and that's what it means to the teen. I'm looking at Psalms, chapter 25 and verse 7. It says, Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to thy loving kindness, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Let's look at two points here. One, remember not. Christians, teenagers, isn't it great to know that we have a God who can and is willing to forget all of our past sins, whatever they might be? Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. It says, Or are ye ignorant that all who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him through baptism unto death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. Once we have been baptized, we are new creatures, and God no longer remembers us for who we used to be. Look at the second point. David says, remember me. Once we have risen from the watery grave of baptism, we are given the chance for God to see us and to remember us as for the good things that we've done, for the good things that we've done for Him. We are given the chance to allow Him to remember us and to see us as someone who helped further His kingdom, someone who helped win souls for Him. And Christians, what a great thing that that is. I'm Tate Williams, and that's what it means to the team. I'm looking at the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 11 and verse 9. It says, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart. Okay, so let's look at three things that I get from this verse. One, we should be excited to worship and serve the Lord. Two, we should be an encouragement to one another. And three, we need to be a light that shines in this world. Okay, so one, we should be excited to serve and worship God. Psalms 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Serving and worshiping the Lord should be something we view as something that we get to do, not something that we have to do. Serving and worshiping the Lord should be something that we are thrilled to do. Okay? Now let's look at the second one. We are to be an encouragement to one another. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in this dark and sinful world, we need to be there for each other, to be each other's greatest source of strength and encouragement. We should always be there to lift one another, up, one another up. Third, we are to be a light that shines in this world. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 16. It says, Let your light so shine before men that others may see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Before the people of this sinful world, we need to be a bright and shining light that they can see the example of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So, Christians, may we be excited to worship and serve the Lord. May we be an encouragement to one another and may we be a light that shines in this world. I'm Tate Williams, and that's what it means to the teen. I'm looking at Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 1. It says, Remember also thy Creator in the days of thy youth, before the evil days come, and the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Let's look at two things in this verse. One, there is an almighty God in heaven. And two, we need to keep the word of the Lord in our hearts. Okay, so let's look at the first one, that there is an almighty God in heaven. Look in your Bibles at the book of Acts, in chapter 17, in verses 24 through 25. It says, The God that made the world and all things therein, He, being Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is He served by men's hands, as though He needed anything, seeing He Himself giveth to all life and breath, and all things. There is an almighty heavenly Father, a God in heaven. 
Though all around us people are trying to destroy the existence of this God, we must never forget our God. We must never forget that there is an almighty God in heaven. Second, we are to keep the word of the Lord in our hearts. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 says, Study to show thyself approved, a workman who needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Hosea 4 and verse 6 says, For my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. The word of God should be something we think and meditate on constantly. It should be constantly on our hearts. Because if we allow ourselves to forget our God and to no longer keep the word of the Lord in our heart, a dark day may come when we say, I have no pleasure in them. I no longer have any pleasure in serving nor worshiping my God. So brethren, may we keep the word of the Lord in our hearts. And may we always remember that there is an almighty heavenly father. I am Tate Williams, and that's what it means to the teen. I'm looking at Luke chapter 2 and verse 52. It says, And Jesus advanced in wisdom and stature and favor with God and men. John Quincy Adams said, The first and only book deserving of universal attention is the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 through 17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. A knowledge of the Bible is the most important thing one can have a knowledge about. God has given us his word so that we could study and grow in favor of him and that we could grow closer to him. It's important to have a knowledge of the Bible, not only so that we can study and grow closer to God, but so we can also better ourselves to be able to do those things that he's commanded us to do. Also, it helps us to be able to go out into this world and tell the world what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, did. That he came to this earth and he died on the cross for the sins of all mankind. Look at 1 Timothy, no, 2 Timothy rather. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, Preach the word, be urgent in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. So Christians... May we strive to have a thorough knowledge of the Bible. I'm Tate Williams, and that's what it means to the teen. Looking at Psalms 119 and verse 9, it says, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to the word of God. We can look at three points. One, how shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Being a teenager myself, I understand and am fully aware of the challenges and temptations that face us on a regular basis. We're having to fight to secure our lives and our beliefs, as well as guard our lives from sin. For some of us, living in this dark and sinful world can feel like being lost in a dark cave with no light and no guide. Which brings me to my second point. The Word of God is a heavenly light that guides us all the day. Look at Psalms 119 and verse 105. It says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God shall guide our youth. The word of God is our greatest strength and it will never steer us wrong. Which brings me to my third point. If we allow the word of God to be our light and to be our guide, and if we follow its every command, and if we live our lives solely for the one who inspired those men who wrote this great book, then we will have a glorious home in heaven. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm Tate Williams, and that's what it means to the teen. Welcome back. We're continuing an evening with Tate, paying tribute to this young man and we just noticed the segments, what it means to the teen that Tate had recorded, and these will be used, and, and this will be a segment uh, in the upcoming GBN program text message. Uh, speaking of what it means to the teen, we have a teenager here with us now. This is Tate's brother, Thad. Good to have you with us, Thad. It's and good to I be mentioned here. that I preach at the Bremen Church of Christ, and Thad and his family are members there, and Thad is a good friend of mine. I appreciate him. Uh, making the trip up here with me today. We were talking just a few moments ago, and I want to let Thad uh, let you share this with the viewers. Something very interesting that happened. Most people, if if you know Tate at all, you know he was a, a an avid Alabama football fan. I loved Alabama football, and so I'm going to 
I'm going to let you take it from there and tell our viewers about this story. Well, first thing I'd like to talk about is uh, at home, Tate's bedroom. Uh, a few years ago, we had our bedrooms redone. And I, I know you've seen them. Um, and my mom painted two of my brother's walls gray, and one behind his bed was crimson. And on that crimson wall, there's a big Alabama A, and then on the, crim and on the gray wall, there's a big Alabama elephant. And everything in Tate's room, his, his sheets, his pillows, his, uh, his blankets, everything is Alabama. And uh, Tate was a huge Alabama fan. And somehow, I don't know how the connection was made, but somehow word that Tate had died and uh, how big of an Alabama fan he was got around to Nick Saban. And so Nick Saban uh, grabbed a football. He said, I want, I want to do something Saban, for these people. Nick Saban, for those who may be living in a shell somewhere and not know this, <laughs> the head coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide football team. But uh, word got around to Nick Saban that uh, how big he an Alabama fan he was. And so he took a football and he signed the football. And uh, Mark Ingram, uh, Alabama's first Heisman Trophy winner, just so happened to be in the room. And he said, hey, I want to sign the football too. And so he signed the football. They gave us the football, and on the football says, uh, in loving memory of Tate Williams. Also, Nick Saban took a picture of himself, and he signed the picture of himself, and he gave us a certificate of authenticity. We don't know when this is going to happen, but we also have permission to take a tour of the stadium. And when we are at the stadium, we can pour Tate's ashes on the 50-yard line of Brian Denny Stadium. And... You were also, we were talking just a few moments ago that uh, interesting fact that had not even crossed my mind until somebody mentioned it, but you would have been there when Tate preached his very first sermon. I was there. I was nine years old, and Tate would have probably been about 11 or 12. And he preached on Satan's tactics, avoiding Satan's ta tactics. And it was one of those sermons where you write out every word, and you read every word, and you don't look up once. You just look down at the whole time. <laughs> I preached on the armor of God, and I, I, I stuttered, and I was scared to death, and I read every single word and got through that thing as fast as I could. And uh, Tate, I remember when I first noticed the change in uh, how he spoke was after he went to uh, Foundations. He, uh, he got around to starting to memorize his sermons and uh, started to venture from out from behind the pulpit and started to preach more powerfully. It was after Foundations. And Tate, you know, we've mentioned several times that he was always willing in fact, uh, or I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but uh, the last time Tate preached or spoke at the Bremen Church of Christ, uh, he and I had talked on the way home from GBN uh, that one Monday, and he had told me, he said, you know, I wouldn't mind getting more preaching experience and getting more <laughs> chances to speak. And I said, uh, I said, well, how would you feel about Wednesday night invitations? He said, I'll, uh, anything, any chance I any get, chance I would love good. it. And so uh, Brother Jimmy Adams, one of the elders there at Bremen, of course, Thad knows Jimmy very well. Uh, but we were talking that Wednesday morning. I was holding a gospel meeting in the area, in the West Georgia area, and I wasn't going to be there Wednesday night. And so uh, I told him that, and he said, well, I was going to do the invitation night. And he says, I wonder if Tate would want to do it. And so I uh, picked up my cell phone. I called Tate. Uh, this was 10 o'clock or so in the morning, and it was that night. But uh, even that short of notice, Tate said, absolutely, I want to do it. I remember uh, him getting that phone call, and I was thinking, you speaking tonight? He said, yep. I said, I said, you ready? He said, yep. I said, you have anything prepared? He said, nope. <laughs> <laughs> but you knew, whenever you asked Tate to preach, he was ready. Uh, he was going to put in the necessary time to be prepared, and he would do it. I mean, that was just, that's Tate. He did a, uh, was it an Eddie Brinkley invitation or sermon? No um, smoking, smoking or non-smoking? He, he did that for the invitation that night. I remember that. In fact, he, he texted me the next day, or I texted him and asked him how it went. I sent him a, a text message and I asked him how it went, and he told me that it went well. And um, In fact, that, that Monday that we were at GBN, we were going home, and I, had, I was preaching that gospel meeting, and I had two different sermons picked out, and I couldn't decide between them what I wanted to preach for the meeting that night. One of them was, uh, it was based off of, not exactly, but, but based off of a sermon I'd heard um, Eddie Brinkley preach about you better get it in writing. And incidentally, in B.C. Goodpasture's book, uh, Biography and Sermons of Marshall Keeble, Brother Keeble has a sermon that's very similar to that. And so uh, Brother Brinkley took a Keeble sermon and modified it and made it his own. <laughs> and then I took a Brinkley sermon and modified it and made it my own. And I told Tate I was uh, undecided between these two sermons. Well, he liked, of course, the Eddie Brinkley sermon. Mm -hmm. And so he says, uh, he said, well, let's, uh, yeah. he says, I think you ought to preach the Eddie Brinkley sermon. I said, well, are you going to be there tonight? And he said, I hope to be. And, of course, you and your whole family ended up coming that night. 
And so uh, Brother Brinkley, when he preaches, he always has a reader. He'll have a, a young man in the audience, and he'll do the reading. And if he mentions a scripture, he'll say, okay, turn over here. And that, that young man usually will read the scripture. So I told Tate, I said, if you come tonight, I'm going to let you be my reader. I said, I want you to do that if you don't mind. He said, that would be awesome. <laughs> and I remember him saying that. And so uh, I still have on my phone a text message I got from uh, Tate that afternoon. And it said, I'm coming tonight. And I said, I can't wait. And so sure enough, uh, he was my reader. But, uh, you know, Tate loved to preach and he was always ready to preach. And, uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned being there the first time and, and you got to see him grow and, and he, he you guys got to grow together into learning you know different things and getting to be a better speaker i'm gonna be funny here for a second that was okay. back when uh when tate first spoke that was back when he had uh, he looked like a ramon his hair kind of rested right here and went right across his head <laughs> and then he went through he went through different phases with his hair until he got to this right here he went through something we went called a, a fro over which was a big old <laughs> curly afro that he pushed all over to one side and he had the he had the hair that he pushed down into his eyes, and then he finally got around to that. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting to see people go through these yeah. these phases, and bro, nobody his, knows you like your uh, like your brother. <laughs> it's like as he changed his hair, he changed how he preached. Right, <laughs> and, and then yeah, eventually he uh, he had the the gospel meeting uh, look there. He was ready to you you could tell he's uh, he was just he was always ready to preach. He was always willing to preach, and like I said, you knew when you asked Tate to preach, he was going to be prepared, ready to go. Now we're going to go into another segment, and this is a Focus on Faith episode. This was the last Focus on Faith that Tate recorded. This has never been aired on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. This was being uh, held to uh, air in the rotation of Focus on Faith programs. And so now for the first time ever on GBN, we're going to have this particular sermon of Tate's from Focus on Faith. And Brother Jeff Archie, as he always does on that program, will introduce Tate and then we'll be back after that to wrap up an evening with Tate. We're so thankful that you've joined us, and we continue to pay tribute to this wonderful preacher of the gospel, this young man who loved GBN. GBN loved this young man. We appreciate all that he did for the Lord and for the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Now we're going to cut to Focus on Faith. Greetings and welcome to Focus on Faith. I'm Jeff Archie. You know, I enjoy singing, and from time to time, I you know, like to look at songbooks. I think I may have shared this on another broadcast here on Focus on Faith. I want to talk about another hymn today that means a lot to me. This is an old songbook I've had. It's number 31 in this book, Old Christian Hymns number 3. And it's a song that says, Come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. Heaven and earth their praises bring. God is love. He is our sun, our shield by day. Our help, our hope, our strength and stay. He will be with us all the way. For God is love. Indeed, God is love. 1 John 4 and verse 8 defines God as love. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. John 3, 16. God richly loves us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In Romans chapter 5 and verse 6 through 10. Not only known as sinners and enemies, but ungodly. Think about the beautiful love of God and what it means to our lives that if it had not been for God's love and His mercy and His grace, we would not have an opportunity or a hope of life eternal. We want to spend a few moments today talking about the matchless love of God. And in doing so, we welcome back the youngest speaker we've ever had on Focus on Faith. The first time we brought this young man 
on Focus on Faith. He was only 16 years of age. But he's grown into a fine young man. He was a fine young man then. He's a fine young man now. And he's getting a little older, getting a little wiser, and he's serving his Lord faithfully. We love Tate Williams on Focus on Faith. This young man is coming to us once again, and he wants to spend a few moments opening up God's Word, talking about the matchless love of God. So since he's going to open up the Word of God, why don't you reach for your Bibles? Open them up. Open up your hearts. And let's focus on faith with Tate Williams. God loves us. And this is something that we as Christians are completely certain of. Yeah, we know that God loves us. We know that God loves us because He created this beautiful world for us to live in. As we see in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, where it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You know, all the beautiful things that have been made in this world, this world itself and everything that's in creation was made for us because God loves us. We know that God loves us because He, because he sent His only Son to die on the cross for our sins, as it says in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. He sent His one and only Son to this earth to be mocked and ridiculed, beaten, and to die for us because He loves us. We know that God loves us because He offers to us eternal life. As it says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We are hopelessly lost in sin. Each and every one of us are dead in sin, and God knew this. And so He sent His Son to offer us eternal life out of love for us. Brethren, the love of God is astounding. The love of God is unprecedented. The love of God is matchless. If you have your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we'll look at verses 28 through 39. Beginning in verse 28, it reads, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom He did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ Jesus that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For a few minutes today, brethren, let us consider together the matchless love of God. The first thing that I want us to consider today, we can see in verses 28 through 30, that all things work together for good. You know, life is hard. Sometimes we're going to have a lot of down times. We're going to face a lot of difficult things in this life, especially in the Christian life. We're going to suffer in the Christian life. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Look at how Christ chooses to refer to the Christian life. He calls it as being a sheep in the midst of wolves. Can you imagine being that sheep and realizing that you're surrounded by vicious wolves? You know, if you're that sheep, you're going to quickly realize that you're not about to have a very good day. And yet that's how Christ chooses to describe 
the Christian life. Further in the scripture it says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12, Yea, and all who that would live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecutions. We as Christians are going to face some tough times. You know, as you go through the scripture, not once will you find anywhere where it says that the Christian life is a walk in the park. Nowhere does it say that the Christian life is easy. But we do read in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1, the Christian life described in this way. Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The Christian life is described as a race. And it's not just a simple little sprint that starts and it's over. But brethren, what's being described to us here is that of a marathon. A race that requires strength and endurance and patience. Something that's going to test us. And what's more, this race that we're running isn't even a race that's run on a smooth and easy path. Rather, it's described in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14 in this way. For straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be who find it. The race that we run in, as Christians is a difficult race. It's a difficult race in and of itself, and it's also being run on a difficult path. And as we run this race as Christians, bad things are going to happen. But bear in mind the matchless love of God. All things work together for good. Now, that doesn't mean that, let's say, uh, we break our arm, we fail a test, or we lose our job, or we lose our house, or if we get in a car wreck, or if we lose a loved one. That doesn't mean that good things are going to come from that. I mean, look at who this promise is made to. In verse 29 of Romans chapter 8, this promise is being made to those who are conformed to the image of Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1, Paul says, Be ye therefore imitators of me, even as I am of Christ Jesus. As Christians, we are to mold our lives after Christ. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, it says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We are not to model our lives after anyone or anything but that of Christ. And if we do, all things will work together for good. But not once in this passage do we read that all things will work together for good now. You see, that promise is never made. However, it was intended for this promise to be kept in heaven one day. So if we conform ourselves to the image of Christ, all things will work together for good in heaven. In John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, Christ said, Let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. For I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again. And I will receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Brethren, let not your heart be troubled. Christ is in heaven right now, preparing for us a home in heaven. And look at what's said in Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. It reads, For I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Brother, no matter what happens to us in this world, no matter how bad things get, those things simply cannot compare to the glory and wonder, compare to the joy that we will experience in heaven one day. Oh, the matchless love of God all things work together for good. Now the second thing that I want us to consider today is that if God is for us, who is against us? As I mentioned earlier, we are a sheep in the midst of wolves. Living in this world day by day, we are going to find ourselves surrounded by those who simply want nothing more than to watch us fall. People who want to watch us fail. People who want simply nothing more than to crush our faith and to crush our hopes. Things 
are going to be tough. You know, we're in a spiritual war. And there could be times where we can doubt whether or not the result of this war is truly going to be in our favor. You know, there could be times living in this world where we just can't think that things could possibly get any worse. And they do. There could be times where we can begin to feel as if we just can't feel any lower than we do. And we do. There are going to be times where we can feel as if the government in this nation couldn't possibly do anything more against the Word of God. And they do. But bear in mind the matchless love of God. Let's consider a few verses in this regard. Look at Psalm 118. Psalm 118, verses 6 through 10. It reads, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do unto me? The Lord taketh my part with them that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations can pass me about, but in the name of the Lord will I destroy them. Brethren, everything is going to be okay because God is our helper. The text says it's better to put our confidence in Him than any man. Now why would the text tell us that it's better to put our confidence in Him than any man? Brethren, because God is not a man. He is the almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful master and creator of all that there is. And He is on our side. Also consider Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 6. Hebrews 13 and verse 6 tells us, So that we may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what shall man do to me. The Lord is our helper. And no matter who or how many of people try to stand in our way and try to stand themselves against us with God as our helper, with God on our side, no man can stand against us. Also, let's consider Joshua chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. It reads, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate thereon day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Verse 9, Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not affrighted, neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Brethren, if we meditate on the word of God day and night, if we take the word of God with us wherever we go, God is with us wherever we go. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. The Lord your God is with you each and every day. Also, consider Psalm 3 and verse 6. It reads, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. When the people of this dark and sinful world set themselves against us, when they surround us and seek to destroy us, we can be confident because God is on our side. Now, as we continue to consider this thought that God is for us, let us consider a thought from Romans 8 and verse 32. It says, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things. God delivered up His Son for us. He sent His Son to this earth to be mocked and ridiculed for us. And look at what Jesus had to say about this in John chapter 15 and verse 18. In John 15, 18, Christ said, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. Brethren, the world is going to hate us for who we are and for whom and for what we stand for. But bear in mind the matchless love of God. He sent His Son to this world to be hated first. Christ died 
but he now stands on our side. And with him on our side, we can overcome anything. And as we notice in verses 35 and 36 of Romans chapter 8, that we are clearly going to have to face things in our life. In verse 36, Paul says it will be as if we are sheep going before the slaughter, as if we are being killed all the day long. But brethren, God is for us. God is on our side. Let's consider one more verse in this regard. Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Matthew 5, 10 through 12 says, Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all men are evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. You know, it may seem a little childish, but as I think about this, as I think about the fact that God is for us, I can't help but think of a song that I heard when I was younger uh, with, with these lyrics. It said, God is bigger than the boogeyman. He's bigger than Godzilla, the monsters on TV. God is bigger than the boogeyman, and he's watching out for you and for me. Like I said, it's a little childish, but you think about what that song is saying. You think about actually how true that that is. You know, if that song, if that fact, you know, that God is bigger, if God is there, if that can bring comfort to a small child who's simply afraid of the monster under the bed or the monster in their closet, how much more so can that same thought not bring those of us who are older comfort as well? Think about it. God is bigger. You know, God is bigger than anything that we may face in our lives. No matter what it is, God is for us and God is with us. Oh, the matchless love of God. He is on our side. The third and final thing that I want us to consider today, we see in verses 37 through 39. And the text says, we are more than conquerors. Turn in your Bibles to John chapter 19. John 19, we'll look at verses 28 through 30. It reads... After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It is finished. Rather than think about these words. It is finished. These are not words of defeat. Brethren, these are words of victory. It is finished. Because Jesus uttered these words, we are more than conquerors. Because Jesus said the words, it is finished, we have victory through Christ Jesus our Lord, as we see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 57. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of these words that Christ uttered, because he said, it is finished, we can have peace amidst tribulation, as we see in John 16 and verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye may have peace. In the world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Because Jesus uttered the words, it is finished. Because he overcame, brethren, we can overcome. As we see in Revelation 12, verses 10 through 11. And I heard a great voice in heaven saying... Now has come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, who accuseth them before our God day and night. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the words of their testimony, and they loved not their life even unto death. Brethren, as we see in 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, we are waged 
in a spiritual warfare. But through Jesus Christ our Lord, because he uttered those words, it is finished. We have victory. It was God's plan from all eternity to send his son to this earth to die on the cross for our sins so that we could have eternal life. We have a mighty God on our side and he has had a perfect plan for all eternity. With God and his son on our side, we can have victory. We can conquer anything that we face. Let's consider one final verse from Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 31. It reads, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel? My way is hid from Jehovah, and the justice due to me is passed away from my God. Hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard the everlasting God, Jehovah, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to him that hath no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait for Jehovah shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and faint not. Our God is all-knowing. Our God is all-powerful. Our God is everlasting. And with Him on our side, we will have victory. Oh, the matchless love of God. We are more than conquerors. Now, as we conclude our lesson today, let us consider verses 38 and 39 of Romans chapter 8. In Romans 8, verses 38 through 39, the text reads, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God loves us. And he will not allow anything or anyone to cause this love for us to stop. He won't allow anything to separate us from him. Yeah, as we just read this list of things that God has said he will not allow to separate us from him. You know, as we read this list, though, we find one thing that's missing. One thing that's not mentioned in this list. One thing that can separate us from God. The one thing that can separate us from God, the one thing that can separate you from your God is you. Brethren, God's not going to go anywhere. God's not going to move. If we happen to find ourselves in a separated state from God, if we find ourselves away from God, it's not His fault. It's through our disobedience to his will. It's through our turning our back on him that we will be separated from our God. So what's the message? God loves you. But it's our job to love him back. And if we love him back, we will keep his commandments. We will do the things that he's commanded us to do and we must hold to him. And if we do, all things will work together for good. God will be for us, and we will be more than conquerors. Oh, the matchless love of God. Because he overcame, brethren, we can overcome. I love that. Tate did an outstanding job with that point. Because Jesus overcame death, we can overcome death. We can overcome this world and live with Him eternally. You know, I've heard it defined when you overcome, it's the same as the Lord saying, come on over. And that's a beautiful thought. I know that you enjoyed opening up your Bible and looking at Romans 8. As Tate dealt with Romans 8 in an uh, expository way, he dealt with a lot of subjects here, a lot of scriptures. He did a great job here in Romans chapter 8. 
And I know that it has been a help to you today. It's always great that we can study and learn about the matchless love of God. And Tate brought a lot of things to our remembrance today of what we can do as we study God's Word together and to look at the matchless love of God. You know, I'm reminded of a passage in Psalm 56 and verse 9 when the psalmist said, When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is for me. Indeed, God is for us. God loves us. And God is for us, and when we are faced with whatever the problems of life may bring our way, God loves us. And you can't outlove God. That matchless love of God stands so true and stands so powerful in our lives. We really appreciate Tate joining us, and we appreciate all of our speakers on Focus on Faith, but I really look forward to the younger generation, if you will, and the good job that they do. Tate will be with us again on Focus on Faith. Be watching for him. You can go to our website at www.gbntv.org. Click on our schedule and you'll see all the programming on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Also hit our link and we have a link that tells you about every program, the host of the program, and what it entails. Please join us on our website. We hope that you enjoy being there with us and hope you enjoy viewing us on the Gospel Broadcasting Network. Again, thanks for joining us. I look forward to seeing you again. And until next time, I'm Jeff Archie. Keep your focus on your faith. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2. Chad, that's a very special verse. The reason is it was Tate's favorite verses. He loved those verses, and at his memorial service, as we placed the program, the order of service, I remember we placed that, or shall I say you placed that at the bottom to remind us all that when we departed that day that we are living sacrifices unto the Father above, as was Tate. And you know, it's been a very special evening in so many ways, Chad. One, being with you, it's always special to be in your presence but also to remember a fine young man such as Tate, but our very special guest of Scott Lloyd and Thad Williams. I was just overjoyed to, to step aside and to let them spend some time with some very special memories of a fine young man. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I mentioned something, and I'll share this with, with our viewers. Uh, I've mentioned this to several people. Um, Tate Williams was a young man whose life was literally saturated with all things spiritual. Mm -hmm. Preaching, song leading. If you ask him to lead a prayer, if you ask him, you could ask him, hey, Tate, could you take out the, the trash in the church building? He would have done it. He was saturated mm -hmm. with all things spiritual. He was a living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we close out this broadcast, and it's been such a wonderful time. As you mentioned, I've enjoyed spending the time with you, and I don't get to see you near enough, and so mm -hmm. I'm excited that we got to spend some time together. As you mentioned, Tate uh, or Thad and Scott being with us, and, and uh, just it has been wonderful to pay tribute to this young man, Tate Williams, who means so much to so many of us. But as, as we close out, I will share with our viewers something that we, we talked about at the memorial. The best tribute we can pay to anybody, young or old, man, woman, who lived a faithful Christian life. The best tribute is for us, ourselves, to live faithfully, to serve God after that example that that man or woman set so that we can see the Lord one day for eternity in heaven and see our loved one again when this life is over. On behalf of Jeff, Scott, Thad, all of Tate's family, we thank you for joining us as we have spent an evening with Tate Williams paying tribute to this young man of God who in his life exemplified everything
that the Gospel Broadcasting Network stands for, and that is standing for the Word of God. This was a young man. He lived his life. He wasn't sinless, but he gave his life to the Lord, and he did his utmost every day to serve God and to grow more and more like Jesus Christ. And when the Bible says, Honor to whom honor, we certainly have done that this evening. And as we end this broadcast, we certainly say that we can imitate Him as He imitated Christ. Thank you again for joining us as we pay tribute to this young man of God, Tate Lamar Williams. Have a great evening. My Jesus knows when I am lonely He knows each pain He sees each tear He understands each lonely heartache He understands because He cares. His life was gentle and the elements so mixed in him that nature might stand up and say to all the world, this was a man. Oh yes, he knows just what